with as a joke by Sulla. True detractors can still find reason to be unimpressed with Pompey's exploits in the eastern Mediterranean, but the fact is he took over a bogged down campaign in Turkey, and by the time he was done marching, he had set up a string of pro-Roman protectorates across the east and expanded the frontier of the empire. More impressively, he nearly doubled the tax receipts coming into the Roman treasury. I think it's safe to say that upon his return to Rome, Pompey the Great had truly become Pompey the Great. In 74 BC, while Pompey was still in Spain and Spartacus was a year away from his breakout, King Nicomedes of Bithynia died and willed his kingdom to Rome. Bithynia was in the northwest corner of modern-day Turkey, and Rome had helped Nicomedes retain control of his kingdom in the face of Mithridates' ambition to control all of Anatolia. In gratitude, he promised that Bithynia would become a province of Rome upon his death. But Mithridates, who had been stalled but not defeated by Sulla years earlier, decided that now was the perfect opportunity to step into the power vacuum and capture Bithynia for himself before Rome could consolidate its own administration. The small kingdom had strategic value that far outweighed its territorial size as it straddled the Bosporus, the narrow strait that connected the Black Sea to the Sea of Marmara, which in turn connected to the Aegean through the Hellespont. Bithynia, in later years, would be the home of the new capital built by Constantine on the western side of the Bosporus, and thereafter find itself at the very heart of European and Near Eastern history. So obviously, the real estate was highly coveted. Rome wanted it, Mithridates wanted it, therefore, war. Rome sent Marcus Aurelius Cotta to Bithynia to establish a working provincial administration in the former kingdom. At the same time, Lucius Licinius Lucullus, a consul from the previous year, was sent to Cilicia, a territory in southern Turkey, as a preemptive maneuver against Mithridates. Lucullus had been a close ally of Sulla, close enough that the old dictator had dedicated his memoirs to him. At the time, he was considered one of Rome's greatest generals, along with Pompey, Metellus, and though he was on the losing end of the civil war, Quintus Sertorius. Lucullus's appointment to the east was definitely a blow to Pompey's ambition, as the east was where the empire was headed and where riches and glory could be won in spades. It was a plum gig that Lucullus had landed, and meanwhile, Pompey remained in Spain, fighting the last round of the civil war that was so five minutes ago. Pompey tried mightily to get himself reassigned, but to no avail. The coming war with Mithridates would be Lucullus's to win or lose. Pompey stewed as Lucullus set sail. It did not take long for Mithridates to make his move. With the huge distraction of Spain keeping the majority of the Roman army busy, the Pontic king felt he could win control of Anatolia before Rome realized what was happening. He moved on to Finia in 73 BC and besieged Cotta's legions. But this was exactly the scenario Lucullus had been appointed proconsul to Cilicia to deal with, and the general marched north upon receiving news of the invasion. He drove off Mithridates without too much struggle, and what would become known as the Third Mithridatic War had begun. Now I know what you're saying. Third Mithridatic War? What about the first two? So let's back up a bit. The First Mithridatic War was Sulla's War, which we covered in detail during the episode Marius and Sulla. The Second Mithridatic War was a brief campaign during Sulla's dictatorship that saw Mithridates make some gains, but the Roman effort shut down by Sulla before it really got going because he had to make sure resources were going to where they were really needed, and they were really needed in Rome, shoring up his dictatorship. So historians call the events that are about to unfold the Third Mithridatic War, though the second hardly counts at all. And I'll stick with convention and not try and reinvent the wheel. Lucullus was not content to simply sit back and defend what Rome had already acquired, and immediately took the opportunity of Mithridates' invasion to invade Pontus itself. Mithridates fled from his home country east to Armenia, where his son-in-law Tigranes sat on the throne. The two formalized a military alliance to expand on the familial alliance that had been sealed when Tigranes married Mithridates' daughter. Lucullus did not immediately pursue Mithridates, and instead spent the next few years consolidating Roman control in Anatolia, control which now covered the entirety of the peninsula. 
content that his rear was well guarded. Lucullus next sent an ambassador to Armenia in 70 BC, demanding that Tigranes surrender the Thridates to the Romans or risk war. Armenia was then at the height of its power, and Tigranes was reasonably sure he could fend off any Roman invasion. He could draw from a huge population to fill his army, and, unlike the Romans, was not far from home or at the mercy of a logistically daunting supply train. He refused to give up his father-in-law. Surely the Romans could see what a poor position they bargained for. However, much to his surprise, in the summer of 69 BC, Lucullus invaded. The two armies met outside Armenia's new, still under construction capital. The historical accounting of the armies ranges anywhere from Lucullus leading a mere two legions of around 12,000 against Tigranes' massive army of 250,000 to a more reasonable 40,000 versus 100,000. But everyone agrees the Romans were vastly outnumbered and that when Lucullus won the battle, it was called one of the greatest in Roman history. As was so often the case in the ancient world, one trained Roman legionary was worth 10 conscripted peasants. So Lucullus is the man, right? He went down as one of the all-time greats, right? He had conquered Pontus. He had just won one of the most impressive victories in Roman history. He was winning battles as far from home as anyone had ever won. Surely he wouldn't be recalled by the Senate in disgrace and replaced by Pompey, right? Unfortunately, Lucullus' victory over Tigranes fled north and re-established himself in Armenia's traditional capital. Lucullus, meanwhile, remained in the south. He had bumped into the frontier of Parthia and decided to feel out the heirs of the great Persian Empire, possibly cement an alliance, before they decided to aid the Armenians against Rome. Tigranes was able to use the time to fortify his position and raise another army. From this point on, though, things started to go very poorly for Lucullus. In 68, he moved north and was able to defeat the Armenians again. However, he had begun his campaign for the year too late, and when he ordered his troops north into the unforgiving Central Asian mountains in pursuit of Tigranes, winter was well on its way. The army refused to budge, and Lucullus was forced to withdraw south rather than force the issue this far from home. The next year, Mithridates moved back into Pontus and swept through the residual Roman garrisons left there, taking back the majority of his old kingdom. The near mutiny was the beginning of the end for Lucullus's command. In a vacuum, he probably would have reasserted control of the army and moved along no worse for the wear. But by this time, Pompey had risen nearly to the top of the Roman political mountain and had allies throughout the empire who were more than willing to stab a few backs to help young Pompey reach the summit. Rumbling and complaining by Lucullus's enlisted men, rather than being met with universal pushback by the officers, was instead stoked by a pro-Pompeian contingent who wanted Lucullus recalled and Pompey put in charge. So 67 BC was marked by an unusual standoff. Mithridates was too aware of his own vulnerabilities to attack Lucullus, but Lucullus was unable to make his own men march out and fight. The Pompey faction in Rome was thus able to argue that Lucullus had completely lost control of his army and ought to be recalled. They didn't mention, of course, that they themselves were responsible for the mutiny, and without their machinations, Lucullus probably would have beaten Mithridates by now. The Senate had seen enough, though, and in 66 BC, Lucullus was ordered to come home. But don't feel too badly for him. He returned to Rome laden with treasures from the east and spent the rest of his days in semi-retirement, living a life of excessive luxury. So renowned were his feasts that the word Lucullan is still used as a synonym for lavish. Plus, his recall to Rome did not damage his reputation as much as you might think. And though today he is an obscure figure, he was a big enough deal in his time that he merited inclusion in Plutarch's famous lives of noble Greeks and Romans, which is basically the Hall of Fame of the classical world. With Lucullus out of the way, Pompey was granted imperium over the eastern provinces in 66 BC and told to do whatever he thought was in the best interests of Rome. Now, in the four years since his consulship with Crassus in 70 BC, Pompey had not just been laying about. Indeed, Pompey had just come off one of his more impressive undertakings, and if not for what he was about to do in the east, this undertaking may have gone down as his single greatest accomplishment. In 67 BC, Pompey cleared the Mediterranean of pirates. All of them. In three months. 
Pompey the Great, indeed. Now, this probably wasn't as hard as it sounds. It was simply a matter of somebody actually putting their shoulder into the project. But still, at the time, piracy was a problem that successive generations of Romans had been unable to solve, and Pompey figured it all out in three months. Taking his cue from Alexander, Pompey did not attempt to solve the riddle of the Gordian Knot. He simply cleaved it in twain and asked what was next on the agenda. The big hang-up for the Romans was that they were never great sailors, and never had much interest in becoming great sailors. They had become reasonably proficient during the Punic Wars out of necessity, but once the Carthaginian navy had been abolished, the Romans returned to the land where they were most comfortable and left the sea to traders. But now the traders were constantly under assault, and Rome's economy was starting to noticeably suffer. So Pompey, looking for other avenues to future glory, in case he never did get that command in the east, asked the Senate to put him in charge of the anti-piracy task force. Despite vehement opposition by conservative senators who feared Pompey's growing power, he was granted an extraordinary command, full imperium over the entire Mediterranean Sea, including all coastlines up to 50 miles inland. This unprecedented transfer of authority was backed, it should be noted, by a relatively unknown young senator by the name of Julius Caesar, who broke with the majority in the Senate to support Pompey's command. But the conservative Senate need not have worried. Though Pompey clearly wanted to become known as the greatest general in Roman history, he seemed to have little interest in making himself a dictator. That was a dream for other men, namely unknown young senators named Julius Caesar. Over the winter, Pompey built ships, trained his troops, and devised a strategy. In the spring, he deployed his navy into 13 separate designated zones, each commanded by a separate legate. Pompey himself sailed with 60 ships, crisscrossing the sea at the head of this mobile command. Everyone's mission was simple, find the pirates and destroy them. Inside of 40 days, the western Mediterranean was clear, and the pirates had retreated back to their bases of operation in Cilicia, Lucullus' old province in southern Turkey. Pompey then collapsed on the bases, and destroyed the pirate ships with overwhelming force. Left without ships, pirates are just dudes who haven't taken a bath in a while, and Pompey induced most of them to simply surrender, promising to resettle them somewhere where they could take up the noble farming arts, make an honest living for themselves, and of course, pay taxes. Three months since setting sail, the pirate menace was eliminated. True, the pirates had been living basically unchallenged by the Romans, and their power had been grossly overstated, but still, a pretty nice piece of work on Pompey's part. So Pompey remained in Cilicia and the surrounding provinces after he completed his mission, helping the surrendered pirates get settled and overseeing various administrative projects. Mostly, though, he was just kind of hanging around in the area, waiting for his allies in the Senate and in Lucullus's army to have his rival recalled. When Lucullus was removed, Pompey was right there to take over. How convenient. At the head of eight legions, and without the backstabbing Lucullus had to endure, Pompey didn't waste any days. The king's army was no match, and Pompey defeated him easily. Mithridates, as he had before, fled to Armenia to take refuge with his son-in-law, but this time, Tigranes denied the asylum request. Whether Pompey's reputation was earned or not is one thing. Whether or not this reputation carried with it real-world effects is not. With the great Roman general in the neighborhood, Tigranes felt that the balance of power had shifted. Now was not the time to oppose Rome. Now was the time to make sure that Rome understood that you were its friend and that you wished it no harm. Mithridates kept on the run, 